uh, and I'm delighted with uh, the uh, the interest that this this panel has generated. Let me just say a few words about the motivation for such a such a panel, and then we'll turn to I'll turn to introducing our uh, speakers. Uh, I mean, if you look at it from an ideal perspective, in an ideal world, policymaking, uh, including the implementation of policy, is based on the accumulation of evidence uh, that is then debated and a decision is taken based on some emerging consensus. But as I said, that's the ideal world. In the real world, we have to acknowledge that many decisions are political. Um, and if you want a recent example, just look at some of the policy decisions around the COVID pandemic around the world, uh, where uh, um, there, was a, a, there was a fair amount of evidence, but sometimes the decisions were taken despite the evidence rather than uh, in, in evaluating it. Uh, and this, this is not just COVID, but it's, it seems to be a pattern around the world. Um, and what this means is that evidence then, if the decision is political, it means that the evidence can be used selectively uh, to support the political decisions. Uh, I think another example is the whole uh, discussion around Brexit in 2016 in the UK, where uh, th there were literally hundreds of economists who were running models and making simulations to show that uh, the decision to leave the European Union would be detrimental to the British uh, economy. But there was one group that produced a report that showed that it would increase GDP uh, in the long run in, in the UK. Uh, they, I think they call themselves economists for Brexit. And that was the group whose research was used uh, by the uh, proponents of, of Brexit. Um, what this means also, on the other hand, I mean, one is that they use that that decision makers might selectively use uh, uh, evidence, but it also means that contradictory evidence can often be suppressed or ignored. And uh, you know, having been in the research business at the World Bank for uh, thirty years almost, uh, I can tell you that that happens all the time. That you you might be doing, uh, you come up with a piece of research that contradicts something that the world, an operation that the World Bank is doing. And there is always a tension there uh, where uh, people would rather that you uh, not publish that research. We always publish it, don't worry about it. But uh, th there was always some controversy around it. Um, now, if this is the situation, if this is the, the, the setting that we're working in, in the real world, um, this has implications both for researchers and for policymakers. Because for researchers, you always want your research to be useful. And so therefore, you might do research that policymakers want to see as just a way of making sure that you have an audience. And that might, again, bias the, the, the results in a certain particular direction. Uh, sometimes and, and always, you also want to make your research more accessible to policymakers. And sometimes that means shading the, the, the qualifications a little bit to make it more blunt and, and forthright. And that sometimes compromises the quality of the, of the work. Uh, but also when, when you do try to make your work accessible to policymakers, that's what then can create trouble for you because if the policymakers don't like what they uh, uh, what you come up with, you might get into uh, difficulty and even have trouble getting your funding. Now, on the other side, though, from a policymaker's point of view, even if a policymaker is genuinely interested in finding out what the research shows, they have to make sure that they're getting the full picture. Because again, you have self-interested researchers trying to feed you information, and you might be getting a biased picture or not, not a complete picture if you uh, seek out the, 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 uh, the research. And on the other hand, there's a tension because you try to create a culture of evidence-based policymaking and evidence use, but that can often lead to what sometimes some people call analysis paralysis. You can always ask for more research before you make a decision, and that might end up being actually counterproductive because decisions need to get made even if you're not in the uh, uh, even even if you're not completely sure. So to discuss these issues, 
uh, we have a stellar panel today uh, of people who have been on uh, uh, both, sometimes either side of this uh, uh, divide between polit uh, policymakers and uh, evidence generators, but also some people who have done both. Uh, and the way we're going to do it is we're going to have one round of interventions of about five minutes each from uh, from three of the participants, and then we will uh, and then we will uh, have a round of uh, discussion from the audience. And let me remind the audience that you should, if you have questions or comments, you should put them in the comment section, not the Q and A, but the comment section. And then we will uh, follow those and and uh, share them with the with the panel. And then we'll go back to three more participants, one of whom will be on video and the other, uh, the other two will be live, uh, who will then speak to the, uh, the, to the same question and we'll have another round of discussion. So uh, let me first introduce the three uh, panelists in the first round. Um, and uh, uh, we have, uh, the, the first will be uh, Irene Guidget, uh, who is the head of evidence and strategic planning at Oxfam Great Britain. So she is very much in the center of this, uh, the, uh, of the evidence business as well as the political economy business. Uh, she'll be followed by Ruth Levine, who is the CEO of ID Insight. And I like the, the tagline for ID Insight. I just looked it up on, on the web. It says, we use data and evidence to help leaders improve lives worldwide. So that's exactly what we're trying to achieve here. And third will be R.C. Balisakan, uh, an old friend uh, uh, and chair of the Philippines Competition Commission. R.C. is one of those people who's been on both sides uh, of the divide as well, because he's, uh, he's a former professor and dean of the University of Philippines School of Economics. And then he was also secretary of socioeconomic planning in the Philippines. So let me then turn to Irene first, uh, and Irene is in rural England somewhere, uh, to give us her remarks and just to react to what I just said about the political economy of evidence and see whether you have examples or counterexamples to illustrate uh, the points we're trying to make. Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction, Shanta. Um, as you rightly surmised, it's a topic very close to my heart and how Oxfam works. So basically at Oxfam, um, I head up the evidence uh, team. Uh, we do a lot of policy influencing with the work that we do on uh, very focused issues. And we essentially approach uh, evidence policy making as inherently political with a small p. And so uh, we recognize that there are issues that are ignored or waved away as impossible or utopian or lacking substantiation, or even lacking um, an emo emotional connotation. And what we try to do is to, to, to influence the policies so that they are changed to benefit ignored groups and issues better. And our, our focus is mainly on governments, national governments and international bodies as well, but also the private uh, sector. And so the three points I wanna make is about the nature of, body, of evidence, on uh, the journey of evidence. And then I wanna, the third point is really a small example of how we did it with um, in the 1990s. Um, so I wanted to start with a quote from Thule Mandosella, and she's a, a professor of law at, at Stellenbosch in South Africa. And she was the public protector of South Africa between 2009 and 2016. And she has a quote who, that I believe really captures um, the dynamics of evidence in when it reaches policymakers. She says, for people who want the truth, evidence is adequate. But for those who don't want the truth, overwhelming evidence is inadequate. And so essentially, uh, evidence is never enough. We need to know, of course, what to do with who and how, but it's never enough. Um, it's rarely sufficient on its own to achieve change. And for us, we look at effective evidence as needing to be credible, really well-timed. It has to take advantage 
of existing or created windows of opportunity for influence. It has to be extremely carefully framed and communicated. It has to be propositional. Uh, so it can't just be, here's the problem. You've also got to accompany it with, and here's the options. And it also has to be supported by other influencing strategies. So that's the first, that's the kind of nature of evidence and how we understand it and experience it. So the second thing is that we really feel that evidence has to be put to work. So we approach the use of evidence as really a small s social and a small p political process. So um, we not only do research on the problems or the efficacy of solutions to, to deal with problems, but we also do research on the system in which evidence needs to land. So we do a lot of research on what needs to change, uh, is it legislation or is it actually practices or is it decision making processes? We then look at who has the power to make the change um, and who or what influences them. Some people are more open for evidence. Some people are more open to certain kinds of evidence and some people are more open to, I guess, a human framing around the evidence. Uh, we then do research on how to achieve change. Will advocacy make a difference? Will naming and shaming make a difference? Will backroom discussions with decision makers make a difference? Um, and we do research obviously on the context in which we're trying to achieve change. Where's the mood going? Where are the uh, uh, counter forces going? Uh, so we actually put a lot of work into the system within which kind of straightforward evidence of problems or solution lands. And so that means that we actually do, um, for any particular issue, um, some of you might know some of our work around economic inequality, we will put forward a whole range of different kinds of evidence. We will look at trends um, a lot, actually, about what is it showing. We will put in human framings by bringing people's voices into the picture. We will be propositional, um, as I mentioned, we'll also look at the nexus. So how does a certain issue relate to another issue so that it might connect with where other aspects of which decision making are interested in? And obviously, we spend quite a lot of, of time on syntheses and translating existing primary or even secondary data into new framings that either highlight the, the starkness of the problem um, or highlight the the feasibility of the solutions that are being offered. So there's these five different kinds of evidence that we put into a journey. So um, just to round off um, with an example, um, in the 1990s, we worked a lot on, um, well, we had a huge campaign as part of many others on the antiretroviral um, medication. And we really wanted to try and improve the access of people with low or no incomes, very low incomes to life-saving medicine. And so the outcome of the work was a reduction of the price of life-saving medication by 98%. And so millions of people in low-income countries were able to access them for the first time. But what that took was really quite a, a moving picture of evidence. So we obviously had to provide very high quality research to undermine the intellectual foundations of the company's influence over government policy. We had to also strengthen the hand of country governments and, and support them to take action at the WTO. We had to demonstrate viable alternatives. And then we also had to um, bring in what I mentioned uh, these human framings to humanize and popularize an issue that then got a lot of media coverage uh, around the existing evidence that it was feasible and the moral thing to do to uh, change the pricings of the antiretrovirals. And so our, our actual evidence mix was secondary data from existing uh, sources, UNAIDS, WHO, but also primary um, case study research from Uganda, let's say, or certain country programs that we were working with, Treatment Action Aid in, in, in South Africa or, and partners in Brazil and Thailand, but also a lot of um, uh, peer review and some research by academics on some of the issues that we were highlighting needing, needing to be changed. And I think what was interesting about it is that it wasn't a one-shot evidence journey. So there was some work that was done in 2001 around patent injustice, but then as um, issues emerged, 
um, in May 2001 and in June 2001, in November 2002, in March 2002, we, we kind of kept um, opening up with new, new insights. Um, for example, a paper in November 2002, we looked at how the US was trying to deal with, uh, with drug patents one year after Doha, or the TRIPS discussions that was a particular battle at the time in March 2002. Um, and so we had a whole range, it was, it, was a, it was a whole drip feed as circumstances changed of different kinds of evidence to accompany that process. So that's how we approach evidence in the context of policy making, that it really cannot stand on its own. It needs to be located in an ecosystem of uh, credibility and, and discussion, and that it requires accompanying research in order for it to do what I call its work. So I wanted to leave it there. Um, okay. I hope that I've been- uh, That's great, you're, you're, you're right on time, and that was, that was a terrific uh, right. opening. I, uh, I, I like the example of AR, uh, ARVs. Uh, I thought when you said, I'm going to give an example from the 1990s, you were going to talk about the HIPAA, the Debt Relief Initiative, no, no, no. Which, which I worked on with Oxfam too. So we'll, we'll come back to that uh, uh, later on. So let me now turn to Ruth Levine. As I said, she's the CEO of ID Insight. Thank you very much, Shanta. It's wonderful to be part of this panel. And I think I'll be able to build on Irene's points. Um, First, I'll just describe a little bit the kind of underlying model of our work at ID Insight. Um, and it's basically built on relevance, rigor, and uh, relationships. So on the relevance side, what we do is we identify a decision, a consequential decision on a, a social or economic policy or programmatic area. and and identify who, who is it who's making that decision and what are the kinds of analytic tools that we might bring to bear to inform that decision. And often what we're doing is we're operating a, a little bit below the surface of the, the policy iceberg, as you will. I think I talked about kind of the things that are maybe above the surface, the things that are maybe announced at global conferences or in um, are, are really seen as high-level policies. We operate bringing rigorous methods to bear on kind of the, the how, the implementation of policy. So things like how are the resources and staff deployed, and um, staff deployed. How are um, which which populations are targeted with particular services? How effective are those services, and how might they be? Uh, change to be higher impact? Um, how can they be monitored so that you can make sure the implementation is going well? That kind of level of work, we bring many different analytic methods to, to bear on, whether it's you know rigorous impact evaluation or um, ongoing monitoring systems, process evaluations, all of that. So we've got the relevance and the rigor. And then with respect to relationships, we often operate in a kind of embedded fashion behind the scenes, working directly with government uh, ministries or other agencies, really as, a, as a, an ongoing daily partner to the, the teams in ministries and government agencies that are responsible for designing and implementing programs. So for example, uh, in Malawi, we've had a long-standing relationship with the Ministry of Social Development. And in that context, we've helped with kind of the, the how of their social cash transfer program, really supporting, as I said, everyday decision-making that's related to targeting how the cash transfer, transfers are distributed, monitoring, uh, having a, an effective kind of dashboard to monitor the distribution of cash transfers, and then also engaging in evaluations to test alternatives like a cash plus uh, program. So we've had that relate that kind of relationship with the ministry for quite some time, years now. Um, and what that permitted was in the context of COVID, an ability to support the ministry when they need, themselves needed to respond very urgently 
and direct uh, transfers effectively to urban populations that were newly affected by the finance, by the economic shock. We would not have been able to be helpful at all had we come in afresh at that moment because we wouldn't have understood the system, the political economy, the decision makers, they likely would not have trusted us, but we had that relationship and could be of really significant service at that time. So that's really, I think, an example of how the you know, long-term relationship building can really support the use of evidence. Again, at that kind of the, the how, the implementation level. And uh, if I have one more, one more minute. Do I have one more minute, Shanta? Yes, yes, you do. Okay, if I have one more minute. I just want to take issue a little bit with the um, with the ideal state that that you propose, Chanta. I guess I am not. Um, I don't agree that the ideal state is when, in a, I'm, I'm paraphrasing you a little bit, in a really technical way, the balance of the evidence is used to mechanistically make decisions about consequential social and economic um, programs. Again, stereo, uh, kind of caricaturizing uh, your comments. These things reflect, that uh, policies reflect social values. And I think that we very much, for me, want a situation in which the politicians are responsive to the, not just the needs of the population, but the preferences, the social values that that um, people have, and then as as those are worked out through political processes, then I think the the most space exists for evidence to be brought to bear on again the the how part of things. So I think at the highest level. Evidence can be useful, but it really is obviously a kind of process of reconciling social choices and um, political conflicts. So I uh, appreciate Good. the extra time to just make that point and Good. over Excellent. to you. Thanks very much. That's a great, uh, it's a great uh, uh, stimulant, I would say, because uh, just to clarify, um, that it's, it is exactly what you said, which is that politicians should have the information about the preferences of the majority of the population. That is part of the ideal uh, the, the scenario that I was painting. What happens in the real world though, is that politicians are looking at one particular part of the population and then using evidence to say, this is gonna benefit that group or using evidence pretending that it's gonna benefit everybody when it's only gonna benefit their group. And I, Think about energy subsidies in developing countries, just as one example of that. Um, okay, very good. Uh, let me now, uh, thanks very much, Ruth. Uh, let me turn to R.C. Balisakhan uh, from Philippines. Thank you, uh, Shanta. Tough one. Evidence-based policymaking or policy-based evidence-making um, I have a slightly different view. Uh, I think of first we have to uh, clarify the scope of so-called policy. Uh, it can be broad, it could be narrow. Uh, broad if uh, uh, think if policy means uh, the constitution, the rules, the regulations, standards, or administrative measures. Uh, but it could be narrow if uh, we are referring to policy as simply uh, uh, the constitutions and the laws uh, uh, providing uh, 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 policy context to certain issues, uh, and that brings me to the uh, to the uh, next issue is uh, about uh, the, the choice of, of policy versus uh, choice of policy instruments. I think that they, in the narrow view of, of policy, uh, where we look at the constitutions and the laws, enabling laws as uh, congressional or legislative acts, and uh, this pro uh, provide the policy context. And given the policy context, uh, one asks whether the choice of the policy instrument from among the alternative instruments 
to achieve the policy objective is, is influenced by evidence. If so, this is, from my view, uh, policy-based evidence making. On the other hand, if the uh, uh, broad view of policy uh, is such that includes the rules, the regulations, or measures, or what we refer to as admin instruments, and, and then the, if the choice from among the alternative admin instruments uh, to achieve the policy objective is also policy making, then the exercise is evidence-based policy making, right? And true enough, uh, as you rightly pointed out, Shanta, most common and more, tract more tractable uh, policy uh, making out there is the narrow view, where uh, we look at the at, at, at the uh, constitution and the enabling laws as uh, as uh, the framing for uh, for the choice of uh, alternative courses of action in this case policy instruments let me provide an example of this uh, just to illustrate my point uh, in the philippines uh, uh, just like in many other countries in latin america and africa uh, we had uh, a a uh, a, what we uh, referred to as Pantawid Pamilyang Filipino Program or the Bridging Program for the Filipino Family, also known as For Peace or the Conditional Cash Transfer uh, Programs. It's uh, the, the government's major social, social protection measure, inspired, as I said, by the CCT, the Conditional Cash Transfer Program in Latin America and developing Asia. And among its conditions were uh, the pre- and postnatal care for pregnant women, as well as uh, uh, regular checkups and school enrollment for children. Now, the policy context to that is that the, the Philippine Constitution and the enabling laws requires the government to establish programs and measures, including health, education, and nutrition, to reduce social, economic, and political inequities and break the cycle of intergenerational uh, uh, poverty. So, uh, given this uh, uh, experiences uh, uh, in other countries, and this were brought to the attention of the Philippines, and so it was piloted. The scheme was piloted uh, way back in 2007 uh, with uh, just a few hundred thousand households uh, beneficiaries, and then the evaluation of that program of that pilot so uh, positive impacts. And uh, uh, that led the socioeconomic planning agency, um, which then I, I, I had under the uh, uh, previous administration, recommending to the, to the cabinet and, uh, uh, and lobbied to Congress to expand the coverage and budget for the program. So by 2016, there were about uh, four and a half million household beneficiaries benefiting about 20% of the country's population or the majority of the nation's poor. The total budget for the program uh, rose sharply from just roughly 26 million in 2008 to uh, 1.25 billion US dollars in 2016 and further to about 1.8 billion dollars in uh, 2019. Now, uh, of course, uh, it's also a fact that uh, uh, that uh, at the time we had a president who uh, who uh, uh, had much respect for uh, for evidence. Uh, in fact, cabinet meetings were seen as uh, as a like you know uh, uh, as a place where uh, uh, cabinet members are defending their dissertation, and that's the kind of environment you get there because the president was so was so hooked with the. With evidence, and we, here we go. Uh, we took advantage of that uh, to to push for this program that has so much empirical basis, evidence basis, to get this program going. So anyway, uh, the, uh, to move this further, uh, we then uh, the government then moved to uh, legislating, uh, getting Congress to to legislate this type of uh, of program such that every year there is a a, a, a commitment from the uh, from Congress to allocate budget for this for this type of program uh, of cover, poverty elevation program. So uh, I, I I guess the bottom uh, bottom line there is that uh, when you have uh, uh, when you set the research network uh, res uh, uh, program uh, well enough such that when the opportunity arises you have 
enough ammunition to push for it, then uh, that I think would be a good and would uh, have uh, provide high payoffs for for evidence and, and research. I stop uh, there for now. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much, RC. I, I love that cabinet meetings as dissertation defenses. That's that's that that be a good motto to try uh, elsewhere. Uh, uh, okay, so we have a couple of questions, uh, uh, and so let me uh, start with that. Uh, the first is from uh, Sabina Singh, um, and it says, uh, "My question is for Ruth Levine." So I'm going to ask <laughs> Ruth. Um, uh, it. It takes years to build a relationship. How can we make ourselves more heard and visible by those with decision-making powers? Uh, and let me add, I had a sub-question to that uh, also, Ruth, if you could address, which is uh, when you're in a relationship, as you had, say, in Malawi, and then you you find some of the evidence says that what the what you have recommended for the government to do in the past has actually been wrong or has not delivered and you need them to change course, how do you maintain the credibility of the relationship in that, uh, in that context? Sure, I'll try to be responsive to both questions. Uh, from my own experience working at a think tank in Washington that was largely focused on trying to influence those in Washington, London and other uh, donor country capitals. And from my experience at ID Insight, I would say that the key to relationship building is proximity. And I don't mean physical proximity, but I mean social, cultural proximity um, to those whom you're seeking to communicate with, you're seeking to influence, you're seeking to have an exchange, understand and inform. Um, and so how does that play out in, in the context of ID Insight? We seek very actively to recruit uh, individuals with strong technical backgrounds who are from the countries in which we work at all levels. And in many cases, these are individuals who have, you know, that kind of proximity. Um, and so that just makes relationship building very, um, I would say, you know, very natural, very, uh, you know, we, we all know that from our own, uh, you know, our own experience in our own countries. And so I think that that is really a key. And not only is that a key to, you know, in a tactical way to, or an instrumental way to building relationships, but it's also people from the countries in which we work who have the strongest you know, who have such a strong commitment to seeing their own countries advance in really, um, you know, really profound and sustainable ways. Uh, we have people from 22 countries at ID Insight, and all of us are, are committed very strongly, but, but it's certainly really crucial that the people who are working in their, in their own countries really have a, you know, that they, they have a kind of uh, different different level of sustained commitment, I would say, on average. Um, so uh, now I've lost track a little bit of the of the question, Shanti. You answered some. Sorry. What happens when the relationship has to change? The, the, the evidence you gave and the recommendations you made are actually changing, and they're different, and you have to. Yeah, say, we yeah. were wrong then. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the model for how we work is very much kind of interactive and iterative. So it's not like we come with, you know, a kind of, you know, package of evidence and say, this is what you should do. But rather, we co-create the questions we're asking. We bring our analytic strength to bear. Often our counterparts in government or, you know, we also work with NGOs, they bring they're deep contextual. They understand how the system works, what's possible within the constraints of the system. So I would say that um, you know the the, the particularly within a, the context of a learning partnership, the way we have in Malawi, it's it's an ongoing iteration and conversation. And so we together would observe that things aren't playing out as expected, and, and think together about what needs to be done. We also, I will say, um, 
only make findings from our work public with the permission of the clients with whom we work, the, the governments or NGOs or funders with whom we work. And so that actually does sort of place us a little bit differently in the larger context, um, sort of the, it's distinctive from organizations that have a, you know, kind of inviolable policy of like every, every study we do is made, is made public. Like that, that, you know, fantastic way to operate that does sometimes create tensions with um, government counterparts. And we operate in a, in a different way because our goal is to really serve specific decision makers. Great, thanks. Uh, so now there's a question for Irene uh, from Pierre Jacquet, uh, who, who asks, um, what would you, what would you put under the credibility criteria that you mentioned as one of the necessary uh, criteria for evidence to be effective? Uh, uh, is, it, is it essentially driven by the scientific and rigorous content or what role is there for local ownership? And does it have implications for how evidence is generated? This actually builds on Ruth's points just now. Yeah, great question actually. And um, <clears throat> Uh, I think it allow, well, it, it reminds me of some work that I did for uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and IFAD a while back where they said, are, is it possible to do rigorous impact evaluation and make it inclusive? And we piloted a few examples in which uh, it was through a very large program in Vietnam and a national level program um, in, in Ghana later to say, well, it is possible, but you have to be very honest and aware of the inevitable trade-offs that you're making, and you have to make choices. And I think it builds on what Ruth was saying. They, they Ruth was describing an example of how they they make choices about what they do with the evidence because they are aimed at certain kinds of decision makers. And I think we found, basically, we look at, right criteria such as at a very basic level of course recognize data sources and are the findings replicable and you know are the metrics metrics that are believe you know are ones that the, the decision makers are familiar with and buy into but when it comes to this question of um more inclusive forms or more stakeholder uh, engagement in in evidence uh, what we then did is we actually looked at the different steps in, in creating an evidence chain. For example, you don't only just collect data, you also have to frame your, uh, your whole, let's say it's an impact evaluation. And so who comes to the table to reconstruct the theory of change that you're going to then um, kind of fill with evidence? Uh, you then also choose your methods specifically around data collection so that they are partly able to be um, statistically uh, analyzed through a known suite of um, analytical methods, but also allowing you to access insights that you might otherwise not get through more closed types of metrics. Um, and one of the areas where I think we are, it's a, it's a bit of a frontier, is what are the methods and what are the approaches you use to make your sense making, your analysis, uh, and uh, rigorous, and I don't think that we do enough uh, work around that. We assume that it's a it's a calculation or it's an objective exercise. When in fact, different values come are brought to bear on uh, whether a certain piece of evidence is uh, allowed as is allowed in or out of the final conclusions, and so. We're also working on more uh, inclusive ways of sense making where the same data, let's say, is put in front of different people and they then pronounce on what they think that means. And, and there you will get variation coming up as well. So uh, rigor, so credibility, I guess, is uh, has a lot to do with the, the norms and values of who's, in, who are invo who's involved in that whole journey and uh, whether they are part of that journey or not. I think a lot of evidence is assumed to be uh, more objective than it actually is. Um, and 
uh, we would. I would like to see a bit more uh, in inclusion of the caveats and the assumptions that underpin the evidence base that is offered as so-called definitive. You know, when you reach a read a conclusion of uh, a study. I'm always curious about the methodological limitations under which those studies were were uh, operated, and what assumptions were were included in in the questions or in the the causal connections that were uh, being unpacked. And I would like to see a bit more of that present in our studies, so that when we come with new information, or we we pass a law, as as Arsenio said, we know what on what on what assumptions we're basing those those kinds of decisions. So that's a mm -hmm. kind of a good. circuitous answer to-, yeah, no, to that's good. That's a, And actually it's a, it's a good lead into uh, the, the final question in this round. I'm gonna have to move to the next round. Uh, and I wanna, I wanna pose, this was posed to all panelists, but I wanna pose it to RC. Um, and it's also from Pierre Jacquet uh, asking the question, when is, um, there enough evidence in order to uh, justify using evidence to uh, uh, take a decision, uh, given that we never have full evidence. When is it good enough? Um, and it, can it uh, uh, can? How do you justify the partial use of existing evidence? Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, that's a, a tough question, Shanta. But. Uh, uh, Coming from a developing country uh, and you know, working in a developing country, uh, of course, uh, uh, evidence is uh, uh, on many of the policy questions and policy issues uh, is, is so scanty, uh, simply uh, perhaps uh, largely because uh, in these countries, as in my country, there's a very little support. Uh, 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 in Congress or by government to uh, event research and development in general. Uh, for example, uh, in the case of the Philippines, uh, 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 the total budget for R&D, uh, and I'm not talking even about uh, studies and impact evaluation, uh, for R&D, it's less than 1% one, one of uh, GDP. That's uh, hardly going to, uh, to, uh, to be, to, uh, to, uh, bring you uh, a lot in terms of uh, actual uh, actual research. So uh, the kind of evidence you see there in practice are, uh, you know, it ranges from from uh, the kind of thing that uh, the three IE does or GDN does, it's very uh, rigorous or vast to even as simple as uh, focus group discussion results or, uh, you know, uh, or poll surveys and and people believe those, and, and, you, and politicians use those to advance their, their interests. So it's, uh, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, the ideal situation is you all have a very robust research system in the, in the country, uh, uh, run by academics, by researchers, uh, well-funded and supported, so that when opportunities arise for uh, a, a policy uh, a reform, uh, uh, you have those uh, those, those uh, results that you can uh, push uh, use to push for the desired uh, change. Okay, thanks very much, uh, all, all of you, and thanks for the questions. There are a few other questions that I really want to get to, but I think we'll save those for the for the next round, or maybe they'll be answered by some of the speakers in the next round. Um, so now let me turn to. Uh, the second round of panelists uh, and start with uh, Jaime Saavedra's uh, video. So uh, can you uh, load it up, please? Jaime Saavedra is the Global Director for Education at the World Bank. Good morning, good evening. My name is Jaime Saavedra. I'm the Global Director for Education at the World Bank. I wanna thank GDN for the invitation. I'm honored to participate in this session with such distinguished colleagues. Um, I'm really sorry that I cannot be um, live in this, in this event, but I would like to share a few remarks um, uh, trying to address some of the points that Shanta has put on the table. 
So is the use of evidence in policymaking on the rise or not? I, I would say that there are two ways of seeing this. One is that no, countries are not investing enough or putting the institutional conditions to make sure that decisions are based on evidence. There's been some progress in some countries, but not nearly enough. I can mention a good experience during my tenure as um, Minister of Education in Peru, where we set up a unit whose objective, objective was to support policy design through pilots and establish evaluation processes, partnering with uh, universities and private think tanks. That was a move in the right direction, uh, but it's not warranted that the initiative will be maintained a long time. Another option is that now it looks good to say that we are basing policy decisions on evidence. But then, as Shanta has pointed out, governments can take the shortcut and just choose whatever evidence is out there, even if low quality evidence, not even grounded on facts that supports their intended positions and disregard all the rest. Unfortunately, we see too much of that, and that's probably even worse. So let me be somewhat pessimistic. Um, development clearly is not linear. There has been some progress, but in the last few years, my sense is that not only we have not invested enough in strengthening the link between um, the generation of evidence and the use of that evidence for policymaking, but that actually there has been some backward steps. The pandemic gives us a few examples. On one hand, it has been an incredible triumph of science, finding a vaccine, uh, an effective vaccine in record time. But um, at the same time, as many decisions about combating the pandemic have been led by ideology or political pragmatism. The school opening process has been one example. School closures were seen as part of the arsenal uh, to combat the pandemic since the early stages without really knowing if uh, its effectiveness in terms of reducing the spread of the virus. As time passed, evidence mounted that schools actually were safer than restaurants, bars, or shopping malls. And I'm not saying that opening schools is easy. It's an extremely complex logistical endeavor and pedago pedagogical endeavor, but it was possible much earlier than what happened in many countries. But the evidence was disregarded. We really need to combat this trend, being a relentless advocate of the need to provide solutions that are based on scientific evidence. This requires actually convincing people who are not the researchers or producing producers of evaluations, but are the consumers of information and data. We need to continue working in creating a whole ecosystem of educated consumers of scientific evidence, not only in government, but in civil society and in the press at least. But to be effective to make in, in order to make evidence um, used, um, it has to be uh, more friendly, more relevant and more practical. That might not sound like the homework of researchers, but um, the alternative is that their audience will be limited to other researchers to see how good and publishable their work is. First, something very easy. Please don't put results only as a standard deviations. With that, you lose 99% of the audience that you want to convince about something. Second, we need to prioritize evaluating programs that might be scaled up in a cost-effective way. There are so many evaluations that say, yes, this works, but might be too expensive to scale up. Then actually the value of that finding for policymakers is extremely low or could be zero. I want to here raise the attention, your attention to the Global Education Evidence Advisory Panel that we put together between the World Bank and FCDO, in which a group of researchers and practitioners of different disciplines assess the available evidence of not only what works in education, but what works in a cost-effective way. And third, we need to evaluate and assess the policy implementation process. Many evaluations recognize that the design was good, but that probably the lack of impact was because the implementation was not correct. But we leave that for another paper. But usually that other paper never sees the light because evaluating how things are implemented is not sexy enough and is not publishable enough. However, it is precisely in that implementation process where many policies usually fail. So process evaluations are critical and so are the opinions of stakeholders and beneficiaries in education, um, um, which will be the opinions of students and teachers and parents. Bottom line, there's a huge task ahead of us.
um, both to produce more evidence, but more important, to making sure that we work on the use of evidence and that we work not only with policymakers, but with the media, with civil society, with opinion makers, and with the public in general to be educated users of evidence. And I'm very happy that GDN can continue playing a critical role in this development challenge. Thank you very much. Okay. That's great. Without hearing any of the other presentations, his was extremely complimentary with uh, what we've uh, discussed so far, including uh, Irene's points uh, as well. Uh, so now let me turn to the second speaker in this uh, sequence, which is, who is uh, Nazreen Jasani. Nazreen is uh, uh, on the faculty of Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, as well as Stellenbosch University. And she works on evidence to policy and practice uh, based in Johannesburg, although now she's at uh, Kruger National Park. Thank you, Shanta, and uh, thank you for having me on this panel and pleasure to be among so many um, esteemed colleagues as well. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, so I think as, as you come towards the end of a panel, you worry that everyone's already said what you want to say. So I hope this is still going to be interesting. So in thinking about the topic of this panel, I had to go back to the definition of political economy and then try and see the link between this and evidence use. So as a short reminder, when we think about political economy analysis, we think about the distribution of power and wealth between different groups and individuals and the processes that create, sustain and transform these relationships over time. And I'll come back to the point of processes. So similarly with the political economy of evidence use, we think about who gains and who loses from the use of evidence in political decision making. Who has the power to make those decisions? Who has the power to oppose it? And whose voice matters? And then finally, where do the economic interests fit in? So given that I come from a public health and development background, my example uses a health systems ethics lens to explain what we experienced here in South Africa over the last 18 months. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, South Africa banned the sales of alcohol. It was a straightforward, evidence-informed, non-consultative blanket policy. And this was based on evidence that the lockdowns that we had instituted might lead to more isolation, boredom, fear of job losses, mental health issues, and other concerns that would lead to alcohol abuse. This in turn would lead to increased gender-based violence, more alcohol-induced injuries and trauma that would occupy precious hospital resources that we would need for COVID patients. So the assumption was that reduced access to liquor sales would also fall in line with the WHO recommendations at the time. However, the national decision was based purely on the pressure of political parties and experts in the health sector. And that was also given um, that, that evidence showed that the combined total tangible and intangible costs of alcohol harm to the economy were estimated at 10 to 12 percent of our GDP. However, when millions of rands of taxes due to alcohol sales were being lost and about 300,000 people employed in the alcohol sector were at risk of losing their jobs, the economic sector, industry, bars, clubs, taverns, small-time businesses stood to lose a lot more. Different evidence, different implications, different decisions. We started to witness increasing instances of alcohol hoarding, black market sales, industry interference and corruption. Public health evidence, research and decisions became politicized. Survival became more important than health. Individual prospects of poverty became more important than public health protection for health. And misinformation, myths, and conspiracies started flying around and undermined the very efforts that government had put in place to protect the public. So while the health sector continued to push for evidence-informed decision-making, the agriculture sector, the education sector, tourism sector, and even the media pushed for a different kind of evidence for decision-making not only the one based on health maximization, but rather invoking other ethical principles, those of non-maleficence, respect for autonomy, justice and proportionality. Justice is so central to the mission of public health that it has been described as the field's core value. Yet during the pandemic, we focused on the fair disbursement of common advantages, but we forgot to recognize and accommodate for the sharing of common burdens. 
And so the banning of alcohol, while morally and preemptively com was commendable in its intent, it created in some cases further inequity and harm in an already inequitable society. So bringing on board all those who stand to gain as well as those who stand to lose across sectors, across institutions, across communities, would have helped with understanding the perspectives as well as the power of multiple players in the policies that were eventually passed. And as South Africa now thinks about better regulation of alcohol in the country, perhaps the process will be better refined. And we've seen that it is clearly impossible to elicit a one best policy only from a technocratic approach. If we ask why, well, because the health sector is complex and public health authorities are accountable to various stakeholders, but each have different interests and different values. And therefore institutions need to make trade-offs between the concomitant as well as the divergent criteria used to develop as well as implement a policy. So lastly, if I go back to the definition of the political economy, it would be important to also harness relationships over time. And Ruth spoke to this, so did other colleagues about who will seek to influence these processes either through politics or power or both. And while we continue to talk about evidence-informed policies being important, we need to employ, like Jaime said, evidence-informed processes for decision-making. And I think we're seeing over and over again that experience and reality is indicating that messy processes are perhaps better processes for decision-making because they take into consideration the values, the culture, the perspective, different scenarios, as well as the evidence. And perhaps this will result in a more acceptable, a more relevant and feasible policy arena with shared ownership. And then we keep all of that in mind to remember that the evidence ecosystem also feeds into it and is also influenced by it. And I don't know, Shanta, maybe I've taken up all my time at this point, but happy to, to continue the conversation um, with the South African example, but also thinking more about evidence-informed processes for decision-making. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. I've, I have some questions for you too, but uh, we will come back to those. Uh, so finally, uh, in, the, in, in the round of speakers, uh, let me turn to Marcelo, Marcela Melendez. She's the chief economist of the Regional Bureau for Latin America at UNDP. Thank you, Shanta. I, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I hope I can add something to this very interesting conversation. I think there are uh, two types of problems that we need to be talking about. The first one is the generation of evidence. And then the second one is the use of that evidence to actually bring about reform. Uh, on, on, the, on the first one, I, I think we need to uh, go back to thinking what type of evidence uh, is, is relevant and which evidence we make available in the line of what Jaime Saavedra suggests. I, I think as economists, we have uh, conveyed, probably wrongly, that uh, evidence-based uh, policymaking requires always to, to uh, have the gold standard impact evaluations using costly randomized controlled trial, uh, trials that are not only like expensive in terms of the resources that they require, but also require a time frame that a uh, doesn't usually coincide with the time frame of policy making. I think the Nobel Prize of this year going to Joshua Angris, Guido Invens, and David Card is for sharing the sense of reminding us that a correctly specified empirical models using a information that is already there and maybe adding some surveys, but not necessarily based on huge investments in in, uh, in surveys can bring information to the table. But I, I think the focus on these fully fledged impact evaluations has uh, made us not pay sufficient uh, attention to other forms of measuring, measurement and evaluation that are relevant for development. We have spoken today of monitoring and process evaluation. I understand process evaluation in the sense of uh, taking a uh, making a stop when we are uh, doing program implementation to figure out if uh, the program has been implemented as planned, which is a very key issue as, as, as Jaime was saying. And I also want to mention other types of evaluation related to institutional and policy assign. 
uh, that could bring theoretical and empirical knowledge to the design of policies, because very often we see uh, policies that are put in place with good in intentions, but later backfire. A an example for that is maybe, for instance, in some of our countries in the, in Latin, in the Latin American and Caribbean region, minimum wage policies that are uh, not enforced and uh, that, that end up uh, translating into, into large uh, shares of the population actually excluded when uh, minimum wages are uh, either used as thresholds for other types of, of uh, policy benefits or when they are increased. We also should be paying attention to indicators design. I, I, I find that very often our governments are measuring incorrect things or are like are trying to assess outcomes with indicators that, that, that are not properly designed. So these are basic issues that we probably need to be going back to in order to actually be help, uh, helpful. Well, uh, I completely agree with, uh, with Jaime Savera when he speaks about educated consumers of scientific evidence and the need to expand this knowledge. And I, I'd like to say that when we think about this in, in a region, we need to be looking at civil service. I think we have lacking structures of civil service and we need a, this type of educated consumers within our governments, not only like in the like people in Congress making decisions uh, about big, large programs, but, but people who are in the day-to-day -day implementation of, of programs and uh, who are the ones who can filter uh, good and bad uh, evaluations or good and bad uh, measures. And then the second idea that I want to go into, and uh, I think this is really important if we're going to talk about the political economy of evidence-based policymaking is the fact that we, in many areas, are over-diagnosed. There is a lot of evidence that is just not, not going through. And then, of course, on the one hand, there are political restrictions. A, um, an overwhelming example is what we've done with, uh, for instance, conditional cash transfers in the region that have been often expanded uh, in the uh, I'd say in the incorrect direction after there have been uh, impact evaluations that have like very, very rigorous impact evaluations. I have myself witnessed the governments uh, bringing the researcher, the like foreign important researcher and uh, asking him or her to stand together with them when they present this new expansion that goes completely against what they suggested or what they uh, recommended. So, so we have these these political restrictions uh, when it comes to uh, the use of of uh, evidence pay, uh, like that 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 could help us adjust programs. Uh, another example that I can think of is when when we uh, use certain ways to focalize, for instance, subsidies to to public consumptions, the, to the consumption of public utility services. I have this example from Colombia that is painful, by by which a uh, Subsidies are granted, are, are targeted by uh, the socioeconomic strata of households. So households are given a number uh, to, to figure if they should be recipients of subsidies. And we see that those numbers decrease before electoral moments. Uh, the, behind, behind that, I would say, is it, institutional design. Who decides what are the numbers that households get in order to receive the subsidies matter. So, so institutional evaluations, uh, institutional design evaluations matter a lot to prevent this. And then the next, uh, the next challenge is policy interference by powerful groups. Our regional human development report uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean launched in the past July, uh, argues that Latin America and the Caribbean is characterized both by its high inequality uh, and by its very volatile and low average growth. And we're seeing that these two factors are not independent and behind them are, uh, th those, these two phenomena are not independent and then behind them are uh, factors that are common to both of them that are causing us both to be highly unequal and to grow poorly. And it, it, that they interact in, in ways that perpetuate this trap. These are factors that if we could address could move the region in, 
in the right direction in both fronts. And one of them is the concentration of economic and political power, which directly relates to the topic of this conversation. An overwhelming majority of Latin Americans think that their countries are governed in the interests of a few small groups. In a regional report, we examined the, uh, the role of two economic elites, big businesses and labor unions. L like Europe and other advanced economies, our markets are characterized by a few giant firms with high monopoly, with high monopoly power. But unlike Europe, uh, the region is also characterized by a large share of self-employment and a large share of workers uh, employed in very tiny, very low productivity firms. So monopoly power in the region is partly explained by the fact that the larger um, relative most productive firms face no competition due to low productivity. Why am I speaking about this? Because monopoly power translates into business political power. They are two sides of the same coin. Monopoly rents are often used to pay for lobby and interfere in policy making an area that is particularly worrisome uh, in terms of this interference is tax policy. We have a very low tax uh, collection, uh, not enough to pay for development. Uh, and often this low tax collection is associated to very low progressiveness because we are, have not managed to, to tax uh, the rents on the upper side of the, of the income distribution. Uh, as a result, the income distribution in most of our countries doesn't change in its past through the fiscal system. So rebalancing power is key to be able to have evidence-based policy making, at least in the Latin American and Caribbean region. We should be talking about campaign financing regulation, lobby regulation, competition laws and competition agencies, and uh, participating as we are not. Uh, in, the com in the global ongoing conversation about how to tax the super, the super rich, the top one percent. I want to leave it there. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I can see that uh, the chair of the Philippines Competition Commission is paying very close attention. <laughs> I think you guys will have something to talk about uh, even after this, uh, the session. Uh, very good. Thanks very much, Marcella. Uh, that, those were great words. Uh, I, and uh, I want to go to some of the questions on the, in the chat, but then I want to come back because there, I think there's some common themes that are emerging and I think we need to discuss them further. But uh, here's a provocative question by Madhuri Madur da, Das Wadenberg. Uh, I wonder if there's an in-group and out-group in evidence making, either because of the approaches they use or because of where the evidence is published. Are there enough resources to spend on perspectives that should not count, like anti-vaxxers or climate change deniers? Uh, let's see. Uh, maybe, uh, I think Nazreen, you, you touched on this a bit uh, in your uh, discussion about the alcohol uh, ban in South Africa. So maybe I'll let you take that. I was afraid you would pick on me, Shantam. <laughs> Um, I, it's a really tough question, and I think um, I think we're, if people want to find evidence or create evidence um, that suits their purpose and perspective, the resources will be there. I mean, I think we've seen this a lot with industry, whether it comes to uh, tobacco control, alcohol, um, the pharma. I think uh, a lot of evidence comes from uh, those industries to be able to counter the evidence uh, that we provide perhaps from, from other perspectives. And so I think the question on, are there enough resources to spend on those perspectives? I think for those that want to provide um, evidence to support their perspective, they will find the resources for it. I think the question is, how do we ensure that consumers of all different kinds of evidence um, know how to question it, to interrogate the evidence that comes. You know, we're not always going to be there to help um, counter what comes on our WhatsApp groups or the misinformation. Um, we need people to think critically about, you know, what is the source of this evidence? Is it a credible source? It comes back to the question to Irene about what's credible. Um, what, what is the quality 
of the evidence, uh, which is something that was mentioned earlier as well. So I think that it, they're all in groups and they're all out groups, depending on which perspective you're coming from. But it really is about how do we make sure that um, that that consumers and users of evidence, if we're talking about evidence use, um, feel a bit more confident about interrogating the information that's coming to them to feel whether they can trust it or not. Um, the quality, but also the source, um, the credibility of the researchers, the funders, I think all of those come into play. And I think that is the hard job at the moment. I don't know if others would like to, to, to jump yeah. in. Any, any, anybody else? Uh, Ruth, do you want to weigh in on this? I'll only comment that I think this question highlights that this is an incredibly contested area and we're in a kind of global to local battle, I would say, uh, uh, against uh, misinformation, as Nasreen was saying, and the, that this is not kind of, you know, working on evidence is not in any way a kind of neutral activity. We actually are doing so, kind of our work is animated by a belief that systematic and as scientific as possible understanding of the, of the world, observation of the world, um, and systematic, transparent analysis and sharing of that information will advance social and economic progress and that, you know, the kind of rigor and reason that we're bringing to things is a huge contribution, but there are forces fighting against that. And they are fighting against that for precisely the reasons that Marcella, Nasreen, Irene, uh, RC and others have, have talked about. So anyway, I just, I just think that, mm -hmm. that this question brings to bear that we're in a big battle here and we are warriors on one side of it. That's how I would characterize it. Thanks, uh, Irene. Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, Nazreen gave, I thought, a brilliant example of, of this kind of in-out and uh, the dynamics uh, um, of related to one topic. So I think the in-out question, does it relates to an issue, it relates to a context, it relates to a particular moment in time. Um, but I do think, and I'm not going to be very popular, I think, when I say what I'm going to say next, because I believe I might be the only non-economist um, on the panel. I think I'm a, I, I'm an engineer uh, by training. And is that I do think that there's an in-group and an out-group in terms of disciplines that I think would be, that, that we need to look at as well. I was interviewed by uh, one of somebody doing some, looking at the impact evaluation strategy of one of the large UN agencies and 100% of their impact evaluation staff are economists. And so by definition, you will get a narrowing of understanding of what evidence is considered in and out if you only look at one discipline for the source of wisdom. And so um, one of the areas where I think um, we as, and I very much am aligned with what Ruth says, is we're, we're on this journey of trying to challenge uh, certain powers and what Marcella was also beautifully describing with as much evidence as we can, but let it come from diverse perspectives. And so I do think there's an in and an out in terms of the evidence debate that is quite heavily um, angled towards uh, privileging economic thought and methodology above other thought and methodology from other disciplines. And I think that's an area that we could all uh, make a difference in, 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 in asking ourselves, what are we allowing to shine? You know, what eyes are we allowing to shine on, on the issue at hand? So that's the only reflection I wanted mm -hmm. to add to that. That's very useful. It's very good. Uh, uh, the, the, we are actually very pleased that you are one of the non-economists on the panel. We should have had more, but, uh, uh that's fine. And, and, by the way, I think some of that tension occurs within the economics profession, as Marcella was pointing out, the sort of tension between RCTs and uh, natural experiments and, and things like that. Uh, very good. Um, let's, okay, uh, there's a question from Ramona. Uh, uh, so are there systematic preferences for biases of uh, for evidence generated in the 
global north as opposed to locally generated evidence in developing countries. Marcella. Yeah. I, I think there is actually, and, and I think that is a, of a large concern. Let, let me give you a, an example in point. When we think about gender gaps, gender gaps in the labor market are very different in our region than they are in advanced economies. So in advanced economies, uh, the glass ceiling uh, is, is a huge concern. And it is not that it isn't in our region, but we have huge gaps in labor market participation. We have huge gaps in a uh, paid uh, time uh, of, of work. These are, in, in my opinion, the worst of our gender gaps because they uh, imply complete dependence of, of women. They are not like they are not even there to fight uh, about wage equality because they don't have wages. In my opinion, we should refocus the conversation in in the region towards the worst gender gaps. But we are basically importing. Uh, what 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 there is uh, uh, what is like driving the conversation in the in the world. So it is not that we should like. Of course, we are in a global in a global uh, economy, and and we need to be looking at what goes on. But uh, just as I uh, mentioned, also with regards to the way we look at concentrated markets, it's very different in our region. We have part of the problem. But we have another part of the story that is complementary. So policies will not like we, we won't be able to co do copy paste, and we do a lot of copy paste still, a lot more than we should be doing. So. Uh, uh, let me go to RC and then Nazreen. Yeah, I think I, I like Marcella's. Uh, 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 comment on that, but I, and I can also add uh, the case of uh, uh, competition policy. Uh, you know, in in Asia, uh, at least in many of the uh, developing countries in Asia, competition policy is a relatively new regime uh, compared to Europe or uh, particularly the U.S. Uh, but uh, when you see uh, the 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 kind of advice, the kind of evidence, the kind of uh, of uh, uh, issues that are brought into uh, to, to to these countries, you know, that are adopting uh, competition policy, uh, you see and notice that uh, uh, many of those uh, um, uh, uh, tools that are being imported uh, or exported to these uh, countries are. Are, are, are quite inappropriate for their uh, for their context. Uh, so you're basically adapting competition policy in a highly developed uh, system where the legal processes, the political processes, the economic uh, states of development, you bring them to a country like the Philippines or Bangladesh or, you know, or, or, and it's an entirely a different uh, process, different system where many of the markets are are non-existing or, 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 or because of a poor uh, uh, infrastructure, you have uh, you know all these high transaction costs where many areas are you know isolated and and you bring those tools and concepts that uh, look like uh, straight neoclassical concepts you know mm -hmm. into these countries and obviously they won't uh, help uh, 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 efficiency at all because you lack a mis of an understanding of the context, and I see that uh, kind of pressure uh, and um, issues as we develop our co our competition policy regime. And uh, we we need to experiment on things. That uh, are at the Latin country context. Uh, Nasreen. Thanks. I, I guess I'll come in with, um, I'm not an economist either. I come with a public health perspective. And um, at least on the continent here and elsewhere, there's been a huge movement on decolonizing global health. Um, and I think through that movement, you recognize and realize that um, 
that that I, I have a question back on Ramona's question when you ask about um, whether there's systematic preferences for evidence generated in the north. It's like whose preferences are you asking for? So I think those in the north might be definitely looking for more evidence that they trust and believe and as credible from northern institutions. But here in the south, I think there is a lot more reliance and willingness and demand for locally generated evidence that is more culturally appropriate, that's more relevant, um, with trust in local institutions to understand the cultures and customs that influence that kind of uh, evidence. And so I think there is a movement uh, in recognition of the relevance of locally generated research, but I do think that it's a matter of where is their research being found, and I think we're still dependent on internationally accredited journals for academic evidence and research and publications, um, and I think there, there, there's more of this recognition um, in that sense, or of um, Southern researchers that are based at Northern institutions. And so there are assumptions being made about credibility, quality, rigor, trust um, th that come with a very loaded question from Ramona. But I think at least in the field of global health, um, there might be more of a, a balancing out that we're seeing more and more now. Thank you. Okay, very good. Okay, we're, I think, approaching the end. So I, what I wanted to do was to go around the room uh, and ask you for your uh, two-minute uh, takeaway from this uh, very rich and interesting discussion. Uh, so let's, since you started out, let me start again with you, Irene. Um... I, I just love listening to all the other panelists. And I think that we have a huge research agenda together to really understand um, um, the policy process. I think it was Nazreen who described that. It's certainly how, how we work um, in order to rebalance. I think that was Marcella's term, to rebalance it. Um, uh, we're trying in Oxfam to really move our resources and our knowledge base uh, away from um, Oxford, where I'm, I'm normally sitting, and away from uh, the global north. Uh, but we, our, own, our own institutions need to kind of come on board with that movement as well, to kind of rebalance, to rebalance that resource um, and that, that credibility um, of voice. So... I think what I take away from myself is to keep investing in making it visible the the um, the power that underpins any evidence process that we're in. Um, in my own institution, I have to hold tight to rigor because uh, there are also, of course, forces within Oxfam that are uh, you, you, we're in institutions that ha that are very diverse, so I'm, I want to hold on to my my own uh, love of of rigor um, while recognizing the uh, shift that we have to make, which Nazreen was describing, uh, and that re really requires us to understand. I think what Ruth was really talking about these really vested uh, local or national relationships where the decisions are made. So that's my summary for Correct. myself of this session. Very good, excellent. Ruth. Yeah, thank you very much. What a rich discussion. Let me just highlight what, you know, as a kind of participant observer in this field for uh, decades now, let me just observe a few ways in which I think we are advancing that have been reflected in this panel and hopefully in the work at ID Insight and other organizations. So one is that we, I think, no longer talk about evidence-based policies and instead about evidence-informed policies, recognizing the value and just the practicality that there are many other influences on policies at all levels. Second is, uh, Jaime brought this up and I did as well, that the, the implementation of policies itself is a huge space that is um, 
really uh, amenable to bringing the best available data and evidence to bear on the kind of daily or weekly or monthly decision making, not just on the highest level. And that is often a, a really an area of real vulnerability for the success of policies, no matter how well grounded on evidence. So that's the second is kind of the level at which we're, we can work. Third is that I think we have gone from kind of idealizing techno technocratic distance and recognizing the value of kind of proximity and the nuances that come with an understanding of, of you know, the, the constraints and opportunities within a particular public sector system. Um, and then a uh, couple more things that where I think we've really progressed in our reflection here is that we've gone from perhaps a quite narrow definition of what rigor uh, means and what methods are, you know, kind of acceptable uh, to an appreciation for the diversity of perspectives and the application of rigorous ways of thinking in a whole range of different disciplines. So I think along that, all of those spectra, we've just come so far um, and that's been reflected across around this virtual room and I'm excited to see how we're building on each other's experiences. Great. Yes, this is exciting. Um, RC. Yeah, thank you. Well, listening to uh, to this discussion, I it it becomes uh, clear that uh, that we ought to do to do much more. We need to uh, to uh, invest so much more in uh, 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 in uh, evidence-based uh, 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 research, uh, 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 policy uh, uh, development, um, and um, um, uh, this is even more true for uh, uh, countries in the, uh, in, in um, uh, like my country, uh, developing countries, uh, uh, where there is very little. Um, Amount of resources that's uh, usually allocated to uh, uh, to research uh, and uh, and se second is that I, I think that uh, economists would look would have to uh, to uh, become uh, more and more uh, uh, open to working with other disciplines. Uh, I re I recall that uh, when I was first invited to join government, uh, the minister who was the politician uh, was a politician ask that I should learn to be an economist with only one hand uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, he, you know he, as a politician he uh, he um, you know all, is always confronted with uh, you do this and uh, these are the costs and benefits on the other hand you do this you can, and I said you know you have to know the under you have to have a good appreciation of the political context uh, the constraints faced by Decision makers, policy makers, and 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 address the issues uh, that way apart from the the usual metrics that uh, you economists provide to the table. So that, I think that's a uh, that provided me a good uh, 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 appreciation of what it means to be a uh, a policy advisor. You know that it's not enough that you know your costs and benefits. It's yeah. Uh, you have to know more uh, how those uh, costs and benefits are distributed. Uh, what Nasrin said, uh, who gains and who loses, and how that those things are linked to the exercise of political uh, political power. And uh, and the timing is very crucial. Uh, you don't uh, go for a policy proposal uh, that uh, hurt the political prospect of the uh, of the politician you know, just before the election. That is that is a, a no no. So. I, I think that uh, we economists tend to to shy away from issues like that, but I think that to be effective in in, in policy advising, we need to 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 to, to uh, have a deeper appreciation of those issues. Thanks, uh, Nasreen. Thank you. Um, I, I'm struck by, and I know we don't have much time, I'm struck by a reminder of when I was working in Vietnam, we had um, we were doing a study on helmet use on the roads and we had data collectors that were had to count how many people were wearing helmets and how many were not. And as I was observing our data collectors, there was a period of time where nobody was watching the road. And yet when we got the data, there were numbers for the time that nobody was watching the road. 
And so that was data that was input that wasn't correct data. And when I spoke to the, the data collectors, I think it's because they didn't, they were never felt like they were part of the team. They didn't understand the value of this data and how it's going to impact decisions, policies, and programs. And so I think that we can talk as much as we want about evidence-informed policies or evidence-informed processes, but I think we need to embed a value for evidence in the first place in the environments in which we work. And so here in South Africa, during COVID, we worked with the media to train them on what is research, what are research processes, what is a systematic review. And so as media, they're better informed about how does what is evidence, how is it produced, and how does it inform decision making? And the example that RC was giving about dissertations um, happening even during cabinet meetings gives a sense that those in the cabinet understand research, they understand evidence, and can therefore use and understand the value of that for decision making. And so I think the challenge here is really we need to embed um, an appreciation and recognition of why evidence is important rather than just pushing for evidence informed policies and processes. So I'll stop Very there. good, very good, nice. Uh, Barcella, final, final Thank thought. You, Santa. Um, Probably my, my thank you. I've, it's been great to participate in such a rich conversation. Uh, my, my large takeaways, the, the fact that even if it's difficult, we need to insist in the use of evidence for policy and program design. I uh, like the emphasis that Ruth, Ruth made about rigor in every type of evidence generation. I mean, like when, when we talk about focusing not only on impact evaluations, but on other types of evaluations and me measurement. It is, of course, always based on things, uh, on our approaches that, that are uh, rigorous. The, my, my other big takeaway, and, uh, and I think we should pay attention uh, to this, is the fact that we need context-specific applications of evidence, no matter where it is generated. We need to understand the context in which we will be applying uh, such policies. And that context includes a uh, institutional uh, capacity for implementation, uh, among others. Also, that context implies multidisciplinary approaches. And I fully agree with what uh, Irene said. We, we need to generate a better conversation across disciplines because uh, we very often work from uh, numbers and in our little in our little umbrellas, and that um, prevents us from from seeing the larger picture. And last but not least, I I think we need to to go back to basics and to understand that we is not bringing down the level of the conversation, but we need to somehow complement it by understanding that in many of our uh, societies we're just not ready to to like to go to the upper level before we have a completed other steps that are necessary. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is a very rich discussion and I wanna thank all the panelists and the audience for their participation. I think you, Ruth used the word relationship and I think that's what we built here. We have built a relationship because we're all working on similar, uh, similar aspects uh, or different aspects of the same problem. Uh, and I think that's really a very valuable uh, insight and uh, understanding that we've gotten. So let me just thank, uh, thank GDN for organizing, Ramona especially, and the team. And uh, thank you, the participants, for uh, your valuable insights. This has really been a great discussion. We have to close thank now. You, Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks thank very you. Much. Bye, bye. Great to see all of you. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.